Minister conducted her service away back in 2017, and now he's been here twice in 2023. Secondly, can I remind you all about the walk this afternoon at the West Kirk? Meeting at the West Kirk, half past two, the church will be open from three o'clock if you don't want to walk, and I think they're going to just walk around and get to come. Uh, thanks, Margaret, for your welcome. And it's uh, good to see so many people who have now become kind of faces. Now that have been, what, three times this year? As well as I've been back in 2017. So let's uh, dedicate our offering. Let's pray. <clears throat> God of love, we offer these gifts, small though they are. We offer our worship, imperfect though it may be. We offer our faith, weak though it is. We offer our love, poor though it seems compared to yours. God of love, take all we offer this day, flawed though we know it to be, and use it in ways beyond our imagination for your kingdom and glory. Amen. Let us sing hymn 458, at the name of Jesus, hymn 458. <coughs>
sin. We thank you that you chose us not through our own deserving, but through your grace, your love, and your mercy. We thank you that as you chose your people Israel, your disciples, and your church, so also you have chosen each one of us. And we thank you that though we fail you repeatedly, <coughs> though we disobey your will and turn away from you, yet your purpose for us continues and your love endures. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for calling us and we ask you very simply but also sincerely, help us to respond. Living God, you call us to take up our cross and deny ourselves. You tell us that it is only through losing our lives that we will truly find them. You challenge us through Jesus to go the extra mile, to do more than is asked or expected of us. Teach us to give as you have given to us in Christ. Forgive us that we find it so hard that more often than not, we prefer to do as little as possible rather than as much. That we give our help, time, service, and money grudgingly rather than cheerfully. <coughs> Lord, teach us to give as you, have, as you have given to us in Christ. Living God, we thank you for those people who are willing to go there tomorrow, those among our family and friends, in our fellowship of the wider church, in our society, or the world as a whole who give freely of themselves, going beyond the call of duty in the service of others, teach us to give as you have given to us in Christ. Living God, there is so much need around us in our neighbourhood, our community, our country, our world. So many people crying out for help. Show us where and how we can respond. Give us the means, the will, the commitment and the love to reach out in the name of Christ, offering something of ourselves to others, even as he offered his all for us. We continue to pray in the words that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to the rest of the evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> well, the theme of the sermon today is parables of the kingdom. The various parables that Jesus told, um, and a, a parable is quite simply a story with a deeper meaning. Uh, it usually isn't explained, you usually have to think through, think through the deeper meaning for yourself. And sometimes they're left with a loose end at the end, so that you really have to provide the answer yourself and finish the story for yourself. Uh, anyway, more about that later. So, this college uh, reflection now is really something of a, a modern parable. It's called Looking for Jesus. One Sunday morning, nine-year-old Joshua decided to miss church on Sunday school and go for a long walk. His mother often told him that if he missed church on Sunday school, he might miss a chance to meet Jesus. But Joshua wasn't convinced. He'd been going to church on Sunday school for his whole life, and as far as he could remember, he'd never seen Jesus there. So he didn't think he'd be missing much this particular Sunday. Besides, the church that he and his mother went to was an old run-down building near the gas works. The building was really quite shabby, and uh, there were panes of glass missing, there were weeds growing in the gutters and all sorts of places they shouldn't be, and he just didn't find a great place to be and he just felt he might rather go out and run and play. <coughs> well, Joshua skipped church in Sunday school and went for a walk. And he, he took a walk 
over a railway bridge, and when he got to the other side of the railway track, he found himself in a completely different part of town that he'd never been in in his life before. And he noticed that the houses on the other side of the railway tracks were much bigger and much nicer than any in the poor district where he lived, around Gaswatch Lane. Well, after a bit more walking, Joshua found himself in front of the biggest, most beautiful church he'd ever seen. The steeple alone seemed as tall as a mountain. As he got closer, the big church bell stopped ringing, and the last people walked in from the car park. They all had nice cars, and they all wore nice clothes. Some of them stared at Joshua in an unfriendly way, and he became aware of his ragged clothes and dirty face. <clears throat> he didn't see any people from his side of the railway tracks going to this church. This must be the church where Jesus goes, Joshua told himself. It's so big and nice. As he walked closer, he could hear the music coming from inside. He remembered hearing his mother talk about how angels sing to Jesus in heaven. Wow, said Joshua as he listened to the choir. I bet those are angels singing to Jesus. And so he walked up the steps and through the big front doors and everyone was saying, just avoiding him and you know, giving him dirty looks on the way in. And he went into the spacious reception area. He continued through another set of big doors and he entered the sanctuary itself. It was the biggest room he'd ever seen. This must be where Jesus is. Joshua whispered to himself. He noticed an empty seat a few rows from the back, so he sat down to scan the crowd, hoping he could see Jesus sitting in one of those seats. The choir stopped singing. The people around him turned and stared at him again and gave him more dirty looks. And a large man in a black suit tapped Joshua on the shoulder. Come outside, the man ordered. So, back out in the reception area, between the doors, the man asked, Boy, where do you live? And Joshua answered, Well, if you go down the hill, turn out to the corner, cross the railway bridge, and head down that street until you reach Grassrocks Lane. That's where I live. And where's your mother? The man asked. She's probably at church right now, Joshua replied. Well, boy, don't you think it would be better for you to go to that church today? But I saw this church, and I knew Jesus was here, Joshua said, so I came to see him. <coughs> the man found him. Oops. The man frowned. I think it would be best if you were to run along home and see Jesus in your own church, in your own part of town. You really can't stay here. You smell, and you're not dressed for it. Joshua became upset. You just don't want me to see Jesus, he shouted, and he ran out of the big doors into the car park. Sorry, he began the long walk home. And uh, finally he was back in Gaswatch Lane. And Joshua carried on shouting as he made his way home, shouting, God isn't fair. All I wanted to do was see Jesus, and they wouldn't let me in. Joshua shuffled along, staring at the pavement through his tears. Suddenly, he heard footsteps behind him and felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned round, wiped his eyes, and stared in amazement. It was Jesus. The Lord smiled at Joshua, gave him a big hug, and said, Don't be too upset, my son. They wouldn't let me in there either. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's sing in 564, Jesus loves me.
13, 31 to 33. He told another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest garden plant and becomes a tree, so the birds can come and perch on its branches. He told still another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The next reading is Luke 17, verses 20 to 21. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God is not somewhere that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Luke 18, verses 15 to 17. People were also bringing babies for Jesus to place hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God, God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Amen. We sing to him 543, longing for light, to him 543.
onto the form of the parables, which you are seeing are there are really stories um, that are on everyday things, but they have a deeper meaning. Now, sometimes when the disciples have been able to think about it, um, Jesus explains what the parables are, are about, say like the, the parable of the sower, for example. Uh, not that the disciples would ever come and say, well, actually, I don't understand that, Jesus. It would be something that Peter would come and say, well, actually, Jesus, the others are a bit slow, they don't understand this, so you have to explain it to them. Uh, I got it across. Well, something like that. Well, anyway, um, they're usually have to work out the meaning for yourself. Um, and uh, sometimes you're left to almost kind of fill in the blanks, you know, to, with your own response at the end. Um, Probably one of our favourite uh, parables would be the parable of the prodigal son, which uh, some people have suggested should be called the parable of the forgiving father. And in fact, when you think about it, that parable isn't really just about one son who's lost. It's about two sons who were lost. There was the one who went off and spent all his money and all the wrong things and ended up broke and had to come back begging for forgiveness. But there's the other son who stayed at home and did all the work. But then, remember, when this brother came home, unlike his father, he wasn't glad to see his brother back. And he wouldn't come into the party and went outside and went in a huff. And his father tried to persuade him to come back in. And really, when you think about it, that parable is putting us in the position of the elder brother, the one who is being self-righteous, maybe a bit older than thou, and thinking, my brother's a waster, uh, he just doesn't deserve forgiveness, unlike me. And uh, the story doesn't actually tell you whether the older brother comes into the party or not. It leaves him sulking outside, and leaves us to think, hmm, where does that leave me? So, many of Jesus' parables are about the coming of the kingdom of God. And uh, I'd like to have a look at uh, some of those today. What is the kingdom of God like, says Jesus? What shall I compare it to? Now, this was no idle question for those who heard the words of Jesus. Because the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago knew that the world had gone wrong with powerful enemies attacking them and exploiting them, and they looked ardently to the future for the decisive intervention of God to put all things right. Now, we too live in a world gone wrong, where there are wars and rumours of wars, with millions of people fleeing from the violence and hopes of a better life, or even just for survival, and so often, as we've seen in recent years, um, they find unscrupulous people who are all too ready to part them, part them from the little bit of money they've managed to hold on to uh, in order to um, smuggle them somewhere or abandon them or indeed to enslave them. Now, what's the answer to this misery? The Jewish people, conquered and enslaved by the Roman Empire, looked to God to intervene, to restore their fortunes and liberate them from the power of their enemies. They look forward to the coming of God's kingdom at some time in the future, which would be prepared for by the coming of the Messiah, God's anointed one. And then came John the Baptist, preaching out in the desert, and saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. This proclamation was sensational, the great and long-expected divine coming point in history was about to happen. The axe has already laid to the roots of the trees, cried John. God would come as king to purify the world, to sift his people, to judge and condemn those who are evil. And at first people wondered, is John the Messiah? But no, John spoke of one who would follow him, uh, who had a winnowing fan in his hand, just as a farmer uses to separate the wheat from the chaff. John urged his hearers to repent and submit to baptism for the washing away of sins so as to escape the coming wrath and to participate 
in the coming of the kingdom of God. And then came Jesus, the Messiah, the coming one whom John announced. He too preached all that John had preached, but with two important differences. Firstly, while John had stressed judgment and repentance, Jesus stressed the saving aspect of the kingdom. And secondly, Jesus announced the kingdom of God not just as a reality which was at hand, something which would appear in the immediate future, but as a reality which was already here, manifested in his own person and ministry, the great future has already become present time. Now Jesus demonstrated this truth by his miracles, casting out demons and healing the sick, but also by his teaching. So let's take a closer look then at some of the parables of the kingdom. So a parable is, as we say quite simply, an interesting illustration of everyday life from which we can draw out uh, moral and spiritual truth. First then is the parable of the mustard seed. What is the kingdom of God like? asked Jesus. It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden, and it grew until it became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. In the Middle East, mustard is not a garden herb, but a field plant. It does literally grow to be a tree. A height of seven or eight feet is common, and sometimes uh, mustard trees have been seen to be as much as 12 feet high. It's common to see a coil of buds around mustard trees, for they love to eat the little black seeds. So what's Jesus saying here about the kingdom of God? He's saying that the greatest things can start from small beginnings. A joint of teaching a handful of followers, yet the end result is a home for all the nations. In the Middle East, the regular symbol for a great empire was a mighty tree, and the subject peoples who found shelter and protection within it were likened to birds nesting in its branches. The prophet Ezekiel describes the Assyrian Empire as a great cedar tree in Lebanon, with the birds of the air nesting in its boughs, and the beasts of the field giving birth under its branches, and all the great nations living in its shade. Jesus is saying that from small beginnings the kingdom of God will grow to become a great empire in which all kinds of people and nations will come together and find the shelter and protection of God. After this parable, Jesus asks his hearers again, What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? Is this like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough? Now this is a twin parable with that of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed promises outward growth, and the parable of the leaven is about the unstoppable spread of an unseen influence. But both speak of great results from small beginnings. Leaven, or yeast, was a little piece of dough kept from the last baking, and which had fermented in the keeping. Without the yeast, bread would be flat and heavy. The yeast makes the dough bubble, and thus raises it, and lightens it. Normally in Jewish thinking, leaven was used to illustrate a bad influence. We know all too well how, in a church meeting, one person can be a focus of trouble, or a centre of peace. There's a good Scottish expression about uh, someone who could start around an empty house. Jesus uses the leaven as an illustration of a good influence. In this parable, even the metaphor tells of redemption. Bread is normally made to home, but the woman in the parable uses the little bit of yeast to leaven a huge quantity of dough, more than 20 litres. Just as a farmer has planted a tiny seed in his garden and it grows into a tree that overtops his house, and spreads its branches to protect the nations. So the woman yeast will cause the dough to bubble and expand and spread out of the oven. In our workplace, or where we live, 
we may be the only Christian believer, yet we can be the left of the kingdom they are. If we listen to most of our politicians, humanity can be improved by better housing, greater affluence, improved security. Yet the kingdom of God works from inside us. If God remains outside our lives, there will be no lasting change and improvement. We have no power to change ourselves. Because we're humans, we keep messing up, we keep getting it wrong, whatever our good intentions. We need to allow that power of God into our lives. Once inside, the Spirit of God bubbles up, changing our lives from within and overflowing to affect the lives of those around us. Some Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come, and he replied, The kingdom of God does not come visibly. No will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I'm saying in, in the, some of the older translations, it says, The kingdom of God is within you. But, even in the older translation, you'll find that in Luke chapter 17, verse 21, there's often a footnote which says, rather than the kingdom of God is within you, it can also be translated as the kingdom of God is among you. In fact, the translation we had this morning was the kingdom of God is in your midst. So, see, there's a, there's a subtle difference there between the kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is in your midst. Remember that Jesus was answering the Pharisees. So it seems unlikely that Jesus would have suggested that the kingdom of God was in each of them. So it becomes apparent that what Jesus was saying was he was referring to his own presence among them, saying the kingdom of God is in your midst, saying I'm here, I'm among you, the kingdom of God. And as Christian believers, we do have the kingdom of God within us. The kingdom of God works within us, not to produce new things, but new people. <coughs> Jesus himself is the embodiment of the kingdom of God. He came among us to plant the seed in us, and he goes on to speak in chapter 18 of his coming again, where the kingdom of God will come in all its fullness. The mustard seed planted at his first coming or have grown to a great tree which shelters the nations. You know, sometimes theologians will argue about you know, the kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God something that is happening in the future? Is it something that's here now? Well, what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God is here now. Not in all its fullness. It's, it's here. It's, it's growing. You know, like a seed. Like a plant getting bigger. It hasn't reached full maturity yet. But it will do when he returns. Now it's for us to predict when that second coming of Jesus will be. Um, down through the 80s, there have been people who said, you know, the world has just got in such a mess that really Jesus just has to come now. Um, and there are people who thought that the kingdom of God would just run the corner. Or, or is the kingdom of God still centuries away from us? Well, the disciples worried about that sometimes. And Jesus said, no, don't waste your time trying to work out when Jesus is coming again. Because Jesus said, not even I know that. Only my Father knows that. So don't try and work it out. You're wasting your time. It will come suddenly and unexpectedly. Now, those of you who are the same generation as myself may well remember a radio program which later moved onto the TV. Um, it was uh, one of the other sitcoms called The McFlannels. Remember that? You know, if some of you remember The McFlannels. Now, Willie McFlannel was sitting at home one day reading the racing results in the newspaper and the doorbell rang. So his wife he came out the late options to see who was the front door. And she explained in a panic and began rushing around the house, straightening all the cushions and tidying things away 
and she snatched the sports paper out of Willie's hand and said, Quick, Willie, does the minister start reading life at work? <laughs> a man who was worried about the second coming of Jesus went to speak to Martin Luther, the great reformer, and found him planting an apple tree in his garden. How, Dr. Luther, the man began, what would you do if I told you Jesus was returning today? Luther leaned on the spade and thought about it. I'd carry on planting my apple tree, he said. Now, Luther's point was that if what we're doing now is a good thing to be doing, when Jesus returns, you, you know, if, 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 it's a, if, it's good, if it's a good thing to be doing now, it's, it's a good thing to do when Jesus returns. Um, or, say if you were working in a shop, and you began helping yourself to money from the till. How bad would you feel if Jesus suddenly turns and caught you literally with your hand in the till? So, really what we should be doing is living our whole lives in imminent expectation of the return of Jesus. So that whether we're, you know, what's a, a, not we're doing stuff like stealing money from the till, but if, say, we're planting an apple tree, that is a perfectly good thing to be doing. And if it's a perfectly good thing to be doing at any time, it's a perfectly good thing to be doing when Jesus returns. We don't need to start straightening the cushions and pull out life to work to put on a show. Jesus is interested in what we're like now. So, don't worry about Jesus returning. It's going to happen sometime. But we don't know when, and it will happen in God's own good time, when, when he's ready for it. The thing is, will we be ready for it? Now, there's a, another wee modern part, this is, uh, this is one of uh, Jesus' parables, but uh, this uh, is strikes me as a good story to, to be telling us now. Um, there's a, a, a minister who's uh, doing some visiting around the district and uh, he went into one house and uh, the lady of the house started to run down her next door neighbour and she said, oh no, she's a, it, I don't like talking to people but you know, she's really not a very clean person, you know, she, she's dirty and I mean just look out the window there, I mean, look at her sheets hanging out there in the, in the, in the back green. You know, her sheets, her sheets are grey, look at them. And uh, the minister glanced out the window and right enough, the sheets did look quite grey. And uh, anyway, the women went on in this style for a while and uh, anyway, the minister left and he went to visit the house next door. The lady was absolutely charming, offered her a cup of tea, which the previous one hadn't, by the way. And uh, everything was stick and span. Looked absolutely beautiful, neat, tidy, clean, nothing, nothing to fault it. And uh, so he had to look out the back window just, just to remind himself what the sheets were like. And the sheets were all sparkling white, like in the best TV commercial. Her sheets were sparkling white. And so he thought, so how come the looks of the when I looked at the next door? And he suddenly realised the problem was that the house next door and dirty windows. <laughs> anyway, back to stories that Jesus told. In Luke chapter 18, we see uh, one such story, which in a way is a parable. It was, it was a true story that you know, Jesus brought out a point. Um, it was the custom for Jewish mothers to bring their children to some distinguished rabbi on the first birthday so that he would bless them. And this is what was happening here. So we read, people were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. When Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child 
or they were influenced. Now, the disciples who were trying to shoo the children away may have been trying to be considerate. After all, Jesus was tired. He was on his way to Jerusalem, where he had said that he would be arrested, ill-treated, and put to death. Surely Jesus didn't want to waste his time and energy on children. Like most adults, the disciples had a selfishly adult worldview. The children should be seen and not heard, or perhaps not seen either. How many advertisers or makers of television programs consider the eyes and ears of children, exposing them to unsuitable content? How many politicians remember that they are legislating for the next generation as well, rather than just trying to look good before the next election? Being older is an obligation, and one of the best tests of adult worth is our attitude towards children. Now, both Matthew and Luke, in telling of this incident, omit two details that only Mark records, namely that Jesus was much displeased by the disciples' action in shooing the children away. And Mark goes on to record that Jesus took the children in his arms as he blessed them. Now, it may be that Matthew and Luke were uncomfortable with the idea that the love of the church displayed such emotions as anger and affection. Matthew and Luke both adore Jesus as God's revealing of himself, but Mark also shows us the fullness with which God and Jesus shared our human life. So they're all telling the same story, but Mark is emphasizing Jesus' humanity as well as his divinity. I tell you the truth, said Jesus, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a little, sorry, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What then are the childlike qualities that we need to enter the kingdom of God? A child has not lost the sense of wonder. A child will marvel into specks of dust swirling in a ray of sunlight. As we grow older, we begin to live in a world which has grown grey and tired, and where God often seems far away. A child, normally, will trust its parents, trust them to provide the next meal, to have clothes ready for them to put on, to take them safely on a journey, to pay the fare, to make sure they don't get lost. The child's trust in their parents is absolute, as ours should be in our Heavenly Father, to take us safely on life's journey and never get lost. Children often disobey their parents and grumble, and sometimes push the boundaries. But they expect those boundaries to be there, and know very well that they should obey, and will not be happy if they are disobedient. In the child's heart of hearts, the fear of God is law. So it should be with us and God. And children have an amazing ability to forgive. Very often, we demand of our children a standard of obedience, of good behaviour, of clean language, and hard work that we often fall down on ourselves. Time and again, we scold them for the very things we do ourselves. Yet they forgive us, and they forget. The world would be a much better place if we could forgive as a child forgives. To keep alive the sense of wonder in God's creation. To live in unquestioning trust in Jesus. Instinctive obedience to God. And total forgiveness of others. That is the childlike spirit. And that, as Jesus taught us, is the passport to the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise be to God. And now our prayers for others. Let's pray. Sovereign God, we pray for the weak and vulnerable in this year world, for all those who feel powerless that their life has got out of control in the face of the massive problems that confront them. 
help of the helpless, reach out to strengthen and support. Lord, we pray for those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are ill. Especially pray for those not ourselves, those who are ill at home or in hospital, for those who are dying, for those who have lost loved ones. Help of the helpless, reach out to strengthen and support. Lord, we pray for those who are oppressed, those who are exploited, those who are abused, or tortured, or abandoned. Help of the helpless, reach out to strengthen and support. Lord, we pray for those who are frightened, those who are lonely, those who are hurt, those who are depressed or anxious. Help of the helpless, reach out to strengthen and support. Lord, we pray for those who live in lands racked by tension, those who face famine and starvation, those who have no work, those who are homeless, those affected by terrorism, those caught in a war zone. Now we pray for the ongoing tragedy of the invasion of Ukraine and for the present tragedy in the Middle East where history just so often keeps repeating itself. Lord, we pray for an end to the conflict, for, for a, fair, uh, a fair and just solution to all that's going on there. Lord, it's such an intractable problem that's going on for, what, 70 years now, war after war, uh, atrocities, revenge, and uh, each side demonizes the other. Lord, we pray for peace in that land where Jesus walked. Sovereign God, you have expressed a special concern for the bruised, the needy, and the weak of this world. May that concern bring strength to all in such need. And may it inspire people everywhere to work for a more just society, standing up for the needy and working for that time when there will be an end to suffering, mourning and pain. That time when your kingdom will come in all its fullness and your will be done. Help of the helpless, reach out to strengthen and support. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 449, Rejoice, the Lord is King, and that please note that there will be some blessing after the benediction.
the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you all, now and forevermore. Amen.